Hi everyone and welcome to this new edition of our FEMA Masterclass series, where this time we will dive into the different angles of corporate sustainability reporting. FEMA has been working on this topic for a number of years now. In the past, we have given the voice of risk management in regards to what then was called the non-financial reporting directive. And now the European Commission is coming with another proposal, which is called the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which was published in April 2021. And this is a key piece of the puzzle to achieve the European Commission ambition of becoming the carbon neutral continent by 2050. It basically reforms the existing rules on the publication of non-financial information in the annual reports of companies operating in Europe. As a very short summary, the CSRD, it's the acronym for this directive, will bring many changes and notably more companies will need to do sustainability reporting than before. Really the scope is extended. Also, the EU will develop its sustainability reporting standard so that there is a common way of reporting the information. And lastly, the assurance of sustainability reporting grows in significance, and we will see it in details. On the 15th of March this year, the European Parliament adopted its position on this proposal. And now, this week, I've started what we call the trilogue, so the discussion between the Member States and the Parliament, as well as involving the European Commission on the CSRD. So you can really see that this masterclass is really timely. So what that also means is that the final text may look a little bit different than the one that will be presented today, uh, but we will go through it in a minute. So our aim is really to give you an early look at what is to come, what will the CSRD mean for companies, and more specifically, how this will impact risk managers. From our research that we've done in 2020, we know that around two in five risk managers contributed in some way to the organization approach to sustainability. And for those who were involved, a major contribution of the risk managers was in sustainability reporting. And to take us through this topic, I'm delighted to introduce our three experts of today. Jean-Christophe Niquez Chateau is legislative officer at the European Commission in the Directorate General DG FISMA. Franco Amelio, who is sustainability leader at Deloitte Italia, and is also a member of one of the EFRAG expert working group providing input to the drafting of the EU sustainability reporting standards. And finally, Valentina Paduano, Chief Risk and Sustainability Officer for SOGEFI Group, and she's also the chair of FERMA Sustainability Committee and a board member of ANRA, the Italian Risk Management Association. At the end of each presentation, we will make a pause so that you know, we can take some questions from you and you can leave them already from the start of this webinar in the chat box that you can find on the bottom left of your menu. So let's start with you, Jean-Christophe, to give an overview of the key aspects of the new directive proposed by the European Commission. Jean-Christophe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sven, and good uh, morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thank you to FEMA to for the kind invitation to speak. Um, a, a bit on myself first. Um, so I'm working in the Corporate Reporting Audit and Credit Rating Agency, um, following development on the CSRD proposal, but also more closely on the work of SHAG and the Project Task Force um, Sustainability Development. Um, I am also working and responsible for the topic of ESG rating agencies, which is um, a, a core one to the EU sustainable finance uh, agenda. Um, then, as going on to the corporate sustainability reporting directive, or as mentioned by the CSRD, the acronym that I will use to make it easier and also shorter in, in my presentation. Uh, and on its history, back in 2014, uh, the EU agreed the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, or NFRD, 
which requires certain companies, so-called public interest entities, meaning listed companies, banks, and insurance companies, to report information regarding the environment, social and employee issues, human rights, and bribery and corruption on an annual basis. In 2017, the Commission published non-binding guidelines to help companies report relevant, useful, and comparable information. Then in June of 2019, the Commission published additional guidelines on how to report climate-related information, which integrate the recommendation of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, the TCFD. The NFRD does not specify in any significant detail the information that companies should disclose. And it does not require companies to use a non-financial reporting standard. That element is key. The accompanying guidelines are also not binding, and with the exception of the, the ones with climate reporting guidelines, they do not provide detailed guidance to companies. Companies therefore have considerable discretion and margin of maneuver in deciding what information to report and in the application of the materiality principle, principle that I will come back to later as well. This helps to explain why there are problems with the comparability of information and why many companies do not disclose all information that users think is relevant. The CSRD proposal, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. The CSRD proposal adopted in April 2021 20, is therefore key to address its shortcomings. The objective is to strengthen the sustainability reporting rules for non-financial corporates according with information needs of market participants, but also other stakeholders, including NGOs. We need a consistent flow of sustainability data all the way from companies to asset managers and analysts to investors. Ultimately, this is about empowering investors to make the right decisions and ensuring that what they ask for in terms of green, is in fact delivered. Mandatory EU sustainability reporting standards are the most important element of the proposal, but there are also other key elements that I will go through. And next slide, please. Which are about a wider scope, as also mentioned by Ethan before, but also rules around the treatment for SMEs, audits, and no less than a digitalization. Next slide. On the scope first, the proposal would extend mandatory reporting requirements to some 50,000 companies from about 10, 11,000 today. Essentially, all large companies established in the EU and all listed companies in EU regulated markets. A large undertaking is defined in the accounting directive and means an entity that meets two of the three following criteria, net turnover of, around, of um, more than 40 million euros, balance sheet asset greater than 20 million, and more than 250 employees. The scope would also include companies not established in the EU that are listed on EU regulated markets and the EU subsidiaries of non-EU companies. We have focused in our proposal on those companies from whose um, investors need the most information. There is a special regime for listed SMEs, simpler standards, and a three-year phase-in for the requirements. The proposal does not impose any new reporting requirements on the vast majority of SMEs, non-listed SMEs. However, there will be a development of simple proportionate reporting standards for these SMEs to use on a voluntary basis. The standards will help SMEs to respond to the demand for sustainability information from banks, but also from large companies that they supply. They should set a reference for the level of information that banks and large companies can reasonably expect from SMEs. These reporting standards will help SMEs to be part of the transition to a sustainable economy. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the proposal would also introduce, for the first time in Europe, a requirement for the audit of sustainability information. The absence of an insurance requirement on sustainability reporting threatens the credibility of the sustainability information which is disclosed. The objective here is to have a similar level of assurance for financial and sustainability reporting, so-called reasonable assurance. However, 
We also understand that a progressive approach is desirable to allow for the development of the assurance market for sustainability information and for the development of undertakings reporting practices. A gradual approach would also phase in the cost for reporting undertakings. There is therefore, this is therefore called uh, limited assurance. Given the potential risk of further concentration of the audit market, the proposal allows member states as an option to accredit independent assurance providers to give their opinion on sustainability reporting. Next slide, please. Thank you. The proposal further anticipates the increasing digitalization of sustainability information. It requires companies to tag information to make it machine readable. The sustainability information can feed into the European Signal Access Point uh, to which the Commission proposed uh, proposal uh, a month ago. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, coming back to the central piece of the proposal, the introduction of mandatory EU sustainability reporting standards. The development of EU standards should provide a rational and a cost-effective solution for reporting companies. The current situation of multiple standards and expectations is costly, but also confusing. EU standards must be coherent with the EU political ambition and with our existing EU legal framework on sustainable finance. That has implications for the coverage of sustainability issues, but also for materiality perspectives. It means that from the beginning, and this is what the PTS and FRG are doing, EU standards should cover all ESG topics, including but not limited to climate. The CSRD refers that it should be ensured that the information reported by undertaking in accordance with the sustainability reporting standards meet the needs of users. The reporting standards should therefore specify the information that undertakings are to disclose on all major environmental factors, including their impacts and dependencies on the climate, air, land, water, and biodiversity, for example. In addition, and this is key, as I mentioned earlier on, the EU standards must, by design, integrate both materiality perspectives. They need to cover not just the risk to companies, but also the impact of companies on society and on the environment. This is the so-called double materiality principle. We believe that this increasingly corresponds to the information that financial markets want, but also need. The draft standards are being developed by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG. The Commission would then adopt the, tech, the technical input from EFRAG as delegated act following also consultation by the relevant EU bodies, uh, that includes ESMA, EBA, et cetera. Um, Commissioner McGuinness, uh, responsible for financial services, um, invited back in May 2021, uh, if I to begin the technical development of standards in parallel to the negotiation of the CSRB, and also invited if I to uh, undergo a governance reform in order to adapt to the new needs. If I has always been working on the financial reporting aspect, and there is a need on that to, to come up with a sustainability reporting um, board, as we, as we do have now. And reflecting, therefore, the target architecture for the elaboration of the draft standards, the work of the project task force of EFRAG is organized in clusters, the clusters that go from climate, environment, social, governance, SMEs, and both sector specifics, but that will be for, for later. They are responsible in the clusters for scoping, researching, documenting, and drafting the first version of the standards. These standards would then be passed on to the new FI governing bodies. Um, the first uh, meeting, actually, of the sustainability reporting board is taking place today, the, 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 this evening, um, in order to, to start the passing, pass, passement de relais between the PTF and Five. The next meeting will then be, there will be two other meetings um, early and end of April. Um, the following um, that, what I can also say here is that at the end of April, uh, there should be a public consultation run by five by the Sustainability Reporting Board on all of the draft standards that have been uh, developed uh, to date. 
this um, public consultation uh, should run for three months and um, and then amendments if and where need be uh, will then be uh, considered before the drafts are delivered to our services next slide please next slide i've already went on that. yes um so on on the timeline a bit i won't be able to give you a definite answer here this is this is an indication um trilogues between the parliament the council and where we're also participating as the commission has started on this year's study last week um, there was a political trilogue earlier this week there is also a technical trilogue where the specific that don't need to be discussed but more political aspects are being considered that is taking place right now with other colleagues also working on on the file um the currently the the proposal speaks about the fact that um the the adoption of the first set of standards is in october of this year and the and it also provides that earlier that the new requirements could be in place would be in the for the financial year 2023 for the reports published in 2024 as trilogues are ongoing and we also understand that there are proposals both on the side of the council and of the parliament with different timeline um, this may change we will have to see how the the trilogues uh, develop but this is the date that we have in the CS study and that uh, still apply um, and maybe uh, uh, one last thing before uh, i conclude um, we expect and we hope the trilogues to finish in about a month, a month and a half. This is roughly in general the time that it takes. Um, and we hope then to be able to have some certainty, well actually full certainty on that as soon as possible. Also for a fact to take on when it is developing the, in the standards. Um, so thank, thank you very much. I hope I gave you some more clarity on the overall uh, aspect. I'm happy to take on any question you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe, for the very clear overview of, of the proposal. And when we look you know, at these slides in terms of timeline, we really see how ambitious it is and that uh, already companies need to start preparing um, in order in case to be ready uh, to report uh, in 2024. But as I understand, there are discussion about the timeline, uh, maybe to give a little bit more time to companies to, uh, to set in motion. Um, it's time if you have any question, if you want to send some question, it's time. While uh, the questions are coming, I have one for you, Jean-Christophe. A big concern that we usually hear from companies um, regarding sustainability information relates to supplier chain. How do you foresee companies dealing with a situation where suppliers you know, are outside the EU and basically can't or don't have the data needed that should be reported? Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, th this is something that F5 and the project that's lost right now are actually working. And so in, in the draft standards that you have, you have different elements. So you have so-called topic standards that go from um, climate, environment, social, et cetera. But you also have cross-cutting standards that apply to all. Some cross-cutting standards include principles around double materiality, but they also touch upon supply chain, value chain. So this is something that AFIC is working on in order to make sure that it works in practice and that is, is proportionate and adapted to the needs. So we will have to see when we receive the draft from EFRI how it works in practice. But I, I cannot say more for now that this is a question which is important. EFRI is working on it and then we'll take this on. But it's very important that it is proportionate. This is what is key to us always. And maybe another one which is linked to supplier chain, but um, also to the fact that SMEs, we see that SMEs, if they are not listed, um, it, they will not have to, they are not in the scope of, 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 the, of the directive. So it will be on the voluntary basis. But basically, as part of the supplier chain, SMEs are indirectly impacted by this directive. Is it also something that you have foreseen? Or you have been discussing when you were uh, 
drafting the proposal? Well, when, when drafting the proposal, what, what was key to us is that we have included listed estimates, and so we haven't included the rest. But then we consider that it is also important that down to also SMEs and supply chain, there is some further use of some EU standards. But then also on the voluntary days, this is the work of a five again that will have to make sure that when the development of those are made, they are adapted to the needs of, um, of SMEs. Again, um, all elements that are put forward now by a five, we understand it with this aspect in mind. And there will be sort of the structure of the standard is going from discussion requirements, application guidance, but you also have basis for conclusions that explain the rationale behind. So it's something that yeah, this is being considered. We all there is also in EFRAG um, right now um, an SME representative uh, organization that is there SME United that is there to make sure that the view and the perspective of SMEs is duly taken into consideration in the work of um, in the standard development process. So this is also something that we are keeping a close eye on in order to again make sure that the proportionality is there for all companies and that SMEs do not get wrongly indirectly impacted by the standards that will come up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question from uh, one of the members of the audience asking about um, the definition of large companies. What is the definition? Is it in terms of turnover, number of employees? The definition of large company is based on the accounting directive. Huh? So this is the three criteria that I had mentioned before. Net turnover, is, well, in order to be as a large company, you need to meet two out of three criteria. The three criteria are net turnover of more than 40 million euros, balance sheets at greater than 20 million euros, or more and or more than 250 employees. If you meet two out of three of these criteria, then you will be considered as a large company and then fall within the scope of the CSRD. Okay. Well, uh, we will move on. Um, so there was a question coming in, but we will uh, keep them for the end during the Q&A so that we've got the chance to listen to um, our two other speakers. So uh, we will now move to you, Franco Amelio. So, um, you will be in speaking about the disclosure of non-financial information specifically, and notably the use of sustainability reporting standard that we've seen from the presentation of Jean-Christophe is very important. So, uh, Franco, the, um, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you. And good morning to everybody. Thank you to Ferma for this invitation and for this opportunity. Now, what we can try to, okay, to explain uh, to uh, all the audience is to uh, try to understand together uh, the importance of the data coming from sustainability reporting, uh, considering that we are talking about a mainstream uh, data. Because now, uh, as you can see, uh, we are not talking about non-financial, but we are talking about sustainability reporting. And this is a big change in terms of, okay, importance, relevance of this kind of data. And we, when we talk about sustainability reporting, we are talking about uh, environmental, social, and governance data in order to uh, add a right picture of what we need in terms of information, considering that Financial data is not enough at this moment, considering all the external uh, uh, and geopolitics, uh, environmental. What we are trying to do is to understand better what my, for example, investment and my decision is, is in the right way, is in the right approach in the medium long term. As you can see uh, on, on this picture, on this slide, um, we have many, many uh, different uh, frameworks of ESG reporting. Uh, and by the way, what we can try to okay to, to analyze all together is that uh, now we have a very a strong input coming from EU in terms of reporting, in terms of Green Deal, uh, decarbonization, and we have a clear roadmap of what we can try to okay to uh, to carry on for the future 
on sustainability. Uh, on this case, uh, for non-financial reporting directives, our takeaway is that, uh, okay, we need to understand how all the corporation, the big corporation, in this case, the large company, as Jean-Christophe has said as uh, before, uh, are trying to explain in terms of ESG impacts. And uh, the standard that mm, mostly European uh, large companies are using is the Global Reporting Initiative. That is a standard uh, coming okay, from several years and here in Italy, but in all around Europe, uh, the practitioners are using the GRI to comply. Uh, in Italy, we are talking about 100% of all the um, undertaking companies that are um, in, in, uh, uh, that are in uh, under the, um, the directive. And now what we are trying to, okay, to implement is the EFRAG standards in order to have a big picture and to have, I mean, uh, all the information are uh, tried to standard, standardize the information, considering that we have a big trade-off to, to, to deal, let me say, in terms of uh, a trade-off between uh, the flexibility that we are trying to do to all the corporation and the harmonization because we need data that are in terms of comparison, in terms of uh, sector. And so we are trying to define this trade-off between uh, flexibility and harmonization. What we can see on this slide is that, okay, we are working on NF NFRD now. We are moving to CSRD. Uh, and CSRD is very relevant uh, for all the information coming uh, from all the large and um, and medium company that are uh, on, on scope uh, on these uh, new directives, considering that we are going to, um, to try to harmonize all the information according to EFRAC standards. It's very, very, very crucial and important. And uh, another point uh, for data and harmonization is uh, considering that new taxonomy. Uh, we are now the taxonomy is working on environmental uh, objectives and, uh, and goals, but uh, as you know, taxonomy is working to define a specific classification for environmental and social matters. We are working to define, for example, for the future, the corporate governance uh, uh, rules coming from new directives in terms of, okay, due diligence activity on sustainability matters. And all these uh, information are crucial for investors to understand how can I allocate my capitals in terms of uh, a right uh, investment and uh, the risk in my investment, considering all the, the, the situation. And in, uh, it's very important from my point uh, to, um, uh, to stress uh, uh, on this point. We have the double materiality. And when we talk in, in terms of double materiality, we need to understand that, no, uh, remain to the, please, to the previous slide. Sorry, okay. When we talk uh, in terms of double materiality, we have um, uh, on the right of this slide, impact materiality. And now on NFRD, um, we are uh, disclosing in terms of ESG impacts. And on this case, we have uh, the flow is from inside to outside in terms of ESG impact coming from corporation for environmental, to give you an example on climate uh, emission, uh, CO2 emission or other social impact uh, or all the impact that usually the corporation, the supply chain, the value chain are in place and we are trying to explain how in this, uh, let me say, a materiality matrix we can consider the topics coming from the corporation and all the operation of the corporation. On the left of this slide, we have the financial materiality, and financial materiality means uh, uh, to the other flow, to the other direction, is the direction coming from outside to inside, what it happens in terms of ESG topics uh, that can affect my operation, my corporation, and my financial statement, okay? And uh, what we can see is that, uh, okay, right, on, on the right, we have many, many um, standards that are able to explain this kind of impacts. On the left, we have several standards where we are working to understand better what it happens 
on financial materiality, considering, for example, SASB coming from US, uh, integrated reporting uh, or IFRS, uh, and the okay, uh, try to have I mean a common principle, a common standard in terms of sustainability information. I think would be the next stage, the next um, uh, milestone in terms of harmonization. It's not easy because when we talk about ESG, we are talking about many, many data on quantitative and qualitative data. We are talking about uh, different uh, way to uh, define the KPIs related to this data. And we are working on actual data and uh, forecast data. So uh, I think that it's very crucial for all uh, uh, the, the audience to, to understand that when we talk about financial data, we have, I mean, a, a backlog, an history, and the information are uh, setting uh, on uh, in Europe, as you know, on FRS, uh, setting on accounting principle. We have a strong history coming from accounting directive, from accounting background, from accounting practice. Now we need to improve a new practice, uh, considering the mainstream coming from ESG, and we need to improve a new way to approach this, this kind of data in order to, to, to try to give the right information to the capital markets, okay? And not only the capital market, but all the stakeholders, considering not all the capital market, but, for example, uh, clients, uh, suppliers, uh, communities, and so on, all these stakeholders. As next slide, please. Next. When we talk... Okay. Okay, thank you. When we talk about the, um, the climate risk and uh, uh, we are working on FERMA, and so for all the practitioners, it's very I mean, uh, clear what uh, we, we, we are trying to, to explain in terms of risk, in terms of ESG risk. And the first, uh, in terms of priority, the first issue that we are now, now to try to, to integrate in, in the risk analysis, in the risk management approach, is to understand what it means transition risk and physical risk. When we talk about climate change, okay, transition risk is the risk that all the companies that are in terms of carbon um, utilization of all the energy, all the carbon uh, products, they need to, tra to transform the operation in order to uh, to uh, let me see to cross let me say a, a river uh, in terms of new products new energy new activity considering a low carbon emission a low carbon economy and this transition is a transition coming from rules in particular eu rules are very clear in terms of transition considering the green deal goals for 2050 and what we are trying to, to work is not only on uh, um, sustainable energy uh, suppliers, on uh, uh, renewable energy, or something like this. We need to work uh, in order to transform the way we, we are approaching our products, our, our raw materials. Now, yesterday, we had a new uh, draft uh, from Europe uh, in terms of circular economy. We need to redesign and rethink our way to approach uh, our economy in terms of linear economy. And now we are working in a linear way and we need to work in a circular way. So when we talk about transition, we talk a big transformation. OK, we are not talking about compliance because if we <laughs> if we misunderstood that we are talking about compliance, it's another it's another matter. It's another field we are working to try to understand in terms of transition risk what happens in my company, my corporation, my value chain, my supply chain. And the transition risk is, we, we need to approach transition risk. Otherwise, we have a big, big issue in terms of physical risk, okay? And physical risk, risk we are talking about extreme weather condition and try to uh, reduce for the next year, for the end of this century, this kind of risk. So, what we, talk about this kind of point, transition risk and physical risk, we, we, we need to keep in mind that uh, in terms of risk, uh, we need to integrate our enterprise risk management, considering this risk, but considering this risk in a very, I mean, clear integration between uh, 
ESG risk and uh, let me de- let me say operational and ERM risk because otherwise we are not trying to we, we need we don't need to do a dual track in on this way. And to the other end, I think it's very important that on this point, when we talk about the financial materiality and we talk about the financial statement impact coming from climate change, for example, we are now talking about impairment tests, okay, useful life of my asset. We are talking about liabilities coming from the transformation. For example, many, many corporations need to have a loan, specific loan to approach this, this transformation, this transition. So they need to explain how I can use this, uh, this funds in order to invest on this transformation. So in terms of financial statement, we have many, many um, items coming from this transformation and we need to understand how to explain and disclose this kind of impact, okay? So it's very crucial to understand that that information coming from CSRD is information that we are able to uh, share with capital market, market, investor, banks, insurance company, asset management, uh, pension funds, in order to have the clear view of what it happens in my operation, my transformation, in order to understand if we are in the right position to transform my business and to have the right opportunities. Because we are not talking only in terms of risk, but we are talking about new opportunities, new business, okay? So this is a new era and we need to understand that for it, it's very crucial when we are talking about climate change and the climate change is, is, a fastly, is a fastly movement and we need to understand how we can adapt our business considering this climate change evolution in these years, okay? Next slide, thank you. Uh, considering CSRD, as Christian Christophe uh, said as before, um, for us it's very important to understand that CSRD, we are working on mainstream, we are working to define a specific set of information that have the same relevance and importance of financial statement, and all the information coming from sustainability are in the management report. We are not a separate report, but we are a specific section of management report when we are able to disclose the information coming from EFRAC, from the new standards. It's very crucial, it's very important. On this, in this case, it's, it's, we are talking about of annual report. We are not talking about of another kind of information. So we need to integrate, we need to work with new, new standards and try to give the right data in terms of standardization, harmonization, and accuracy. It's not able to take decision, to start with my decision-making process in terms of, okay, how can I allocate my, my investment without assurance? On this case, I think it's very important. The, acu- the accuracy of the data is crucial on the same page of the financial data. Now we are, let me say, a journey considering limited assurance, that is a limited assurance, the name is what's clear, I think, and we are working to improve this kind of assurance in a reasonable assurance, considering that this kind of information are the same in terms of relevance and importance like financial statement. Next slide. Considering not only, I mean, Europe in terms of consideration, I think that the published working paper coming from EFRAC are I think in a complete view, we are able to understand that we are talking about environment, on environmental, social, governance, and we are trying to define a common setting of information, considering that the complexity, because we are talking about complex information, we are not talking about easy information, and we are trying to define a standard in order to be able to provide the right information, to disclose the right information, and to have all the setting of data that all the market participants can, uh, I mean, uh, uh, listen and can uh, adopt in terms of decision-making process, okay? I think that now the, the, the coveraging of the EFRAG published work, working paper is, is quite good, 
and the next step okay is to let me say to define a common set of information like this and define all the let me say uh, right approach in terms of the um, disclosure information considering the articulation the complexity i, I repeat the complexity of all this uh, uh, the subject matter uh, consideration in terms of sustainability. Next slide. Another um, input coming from North America, from USA, um, just last week, uh, is, is a draft coming from uh, from SEC, and SEC is working to uh, define a common set of information that all SEC registrant, all SEC. Uh, um, co company that can try to um, to disclose in terms of information and in this case we have three steps of information uh, the first one is to uh, define uh, an oversight let me say uh, on governance and climate risk uh, considering that uh, uh, we they, they asking or may own this draft um, define uh, what are the main impacts coming from climate change to financial statement directly in order to understand what we are the, the main impacts on financial statement for example uh, uh, impairment test uh, useful life of my fixed uh, and uh, tangible asset uh, uh, for example liabilities uh, and, and so on the second stage of, of this of this draft is uh, or a proposal is to um, to disclose um, the main assumption considering the impact that we have uh, in, in in the financial statement and the first the first uh, stage is considering the data matrix coming from scope one scope two and scope or uh, scope three on jfg protocol jfg protocol considering the uh, co2 emission uh, mainstream data okay so uh, now we are Okay, working to understand better this this new standard, but as you can see, uh, SEC is uh, moving forward uh, to to have uh, the right information uh, and for our uh, for the undertaking on US and uh, yes, uh, it's the company in order to add the information coming specifically for from climate change on this case. When we talk about CSRD and DEFRA, we are talking not only on climate; we are talking on environmental, social, and governance. So the three pillars. Okay, in this case, SEC is more focused on climate change. On this case, uh, next slide, please. If we move on I4S, I4S is working to define, uh, let me say, a global standard. Considering that, as you know, we are now working on I4S on financial statement here in Europe and in, in other parts of the world, and we have a strong conversion between I4X, for example, a US GAAP. In terms of accounting principle, uh, IFRS is trying to define, let me say, a common standard, a global standard, in order to harmonize all the information and try to have, uh, uh, on this case, uh, a specific standard that we can adopt considering, uh, and firstly, the climate change issue. Okay. Now, what the next, I mean, uh, step of, of, of this uh, of this journey is try to understand how can we integrate. Uh, to have a common standard and uh, as you know uh, IFRS and DEFRAG is working for the future in order to harmonize uh, the standard I think that could be very useful helpful for all to have a common standard global level considering also the US uh, US rules uh, uh, from my point of view when we talk about climate change when we talk about uh, CO2 emission we have a global issue a global problem and we need to approach if it's possible with only one mainstream or one, one main uh, uh, disclosure approach. But by the way, uh, I agree that we, for, from my point of view, it's very important that uh, at the European level, we are working in the right direction. We are working in the right time and try to, to let me say, uh, define uh, uh, the, uh, to give, for example, an example for the other, for the other markets in order to, to be sure that we are trying to achieve all all together the Paris Agreement in terms of climate change, for example. But I repeat, when we talk about climate change, we don't need, we are not, it's not possible to, to have only climate change. It's a systemic problem, it's a systemic view. We need to 
integrate climate and social. We don't have the possibility to have a, a separate silos with climate and social. We need to integrate. So I agree with the European, for example, uh, rules in terms of to have a common view of environmental and social. Okay, the climate is very urgent. I, I agree, but it's not possible from my point of view to have climate separate to social because it's a very unique and systemic view in order to have the right approach for the next future. Thank you very much for your uh, for your attention, and uh, thank you. I'm waiting thank for you, uh, for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Really, from your presentation, it's very clear that there is a trend towards really more consistent, comparable, and reliable information on sustainable performance of companies, which I would say would be comparable in terms of requirement to what is now being requested in terms of financial information, basically. But um, let's take some questions from, from the audience. Um, I see that there is one about horizons. What time horizons need to be considered for these caps? The time horizons calculation, basically. It's um, about the IFRS, basically. Sorry, I don't hear you. I have a problem for, of, of connection. So could you repeat the, the question because I, I don't hear you. Yeah, the question is what time horizons need to be considered for... You cannot hear me? Can you hear uh, me the now? The question is about the horizon. Okay, Sam, since... Yeah, the time. Um, so what time horizons need to be considered um, for this calculation? Uh, okay, uh, I, I think that it's very important to understand that the uh, horizon, that ne the next generation EU plan for the new investment coming from Europe, uh, it's a, a crucial point to have a public investment and a private investment in connection in order to, uh, let me say, support this transition. And uh, when we talk about next generation EU, uh, as we know, we are, okay, uh, a very strong injection on investment coming from EU to define, for example, a climate change, a renewable technologies, a circular economy technologies. We are talking about digitalization. I mean, this is very crucial. And when we talk about the information, I think that the set information that coming from Horizon Next Generation EU and the other um, grants and the other uh, public investment could be okay uh, in the in the same in the same page in the same set of information that usually the corporation are using to uh, comply with ccrd but i think that we need to understand not only ccrd on this case but the taxonomy for example it's a crucial point taxonomy because otherwise we are not be able to understand how is green and how is not green or greenwashing so yeah. Uh, I think that we need to work uh, on the same page, otherwise we are not able to, to achieve all our goals and uh, objectives for the next years. Thank you, uh, Franco. I'm now turning to, to our last speaker, Valentina. Um, so, Valentina, what is your analysis of the proposal from the point of view of risk managers and, and how do you think it will impact upon risk managers? Yes, Stefan. First of all, thank you so much to Jean-Christophe and Franco because uh, they give us a really clear recap and overview on this new requirement of this uh, new directive. Uh, there are a lot of points that we should comment and discuss to consider, to reflect together on um, how uh, this requirement will affect our company. Um, and um, of course, uh, what, uh, what will be the effort that, um, that can be required to our organization. So, but uh, mm, let me just start from an operational perspective, Tiffany. Um, I believe, uh, first of all, I believe that the creation of a common standard that uh, Franco explained us is uh, a great opportunity for the market uh, and, uh, and the company themselves, because uh, um, that will allow, allow us to be able to easily compare uh, the ESG performance with the ones of other peers uh, and the competitor. But uh, at the same time, uh, 
it is a big challenge. Um, over the past years, uh, uh, our companies worked a lot to set uh, internal processes uh, um, for, um, for collection and monitoring uh, uh, the KPIs. And um, for example, in my experience, aligned, uh, we are aligned um, what's said by Frank. Of course, we adopted the GRI standards uh, and uh, it is a effectively the, the, the common choice in Italy. Um, and um, after six, seven years of adoption of the implementation of the non-financial reporting directive, this process has been consolidated. Um, we improved continuously the quality and the reliability of the data, the information provided, um, also to have a, a most efficient process to collect and to report this data in the, um, in the, in the non-financial report. Now, it is requested to review this process and likely to rethink the calculation method, the assumptions, uh, and, and so on. Um, I really hope that uh, this common standard will be published on time to allow the company to have a, a reasonable period to prepare uh, the internal processes before the preparation of the non-financial statement. Uh, there are many data to report. Uh, they are usually complex uh, with a uh, high level of detail um, that is required. So um, it is not immediate for a company to comply with uh, that requirements and ensure a proper level of data governance. So I really hope that this process uh, will be uh, aligned uh, with uh, the timing expectation. Um, another point that I would like also to, on which to reflect uh, is uh, the external assurance. Uh, in Italy, it is not uh, a news because uh, our Italian decree on non-financial reporting uh, is already defined uh, to have an external assurance on our new financial reporting. So let me give my experience on that. First of all, uh, what I can say is that the external assurance is a great opportunity because uh, uh, give value um, to the to give gavel to, to give give, uh, value to the non-financial statement, of course. But uh, it is a further factor of complexity in the process of the reporting preparation. Uh, sometimes uh, the external auditors uh, mm, could require a compliance approach to the regulation that is not always business oriented, uh, being wider than what can be interpreted by the company. And uh, usually it creates a difficult debate with the auditors. So um, the process and the approach in general must be set uh, considering that uh, they have to achieve the external assurance, uh, the governance of the data collected and reported in the non-financial statement is one of the main aspects that usually is evaluated by an external auditor. So it is really important, uh, based on my experience, to work on, uh, on that together with the operational uh, KPIs. So um, it is really important to establish a collaborative relationship with external auditors by sharing and discussing with them uh, the approach to adopt and the key steps over the report preparation. This could facilitate the process and, uh, and the assurance of, of the report. Um, finally, uh, let me comment the uh, double materiality that I consider one of the key steps for the non-financial uh, reporting um, and also the big opportunity for, um, for us as risk managers. Um, until today, it is requested to assess the relevance of ESG aspect uh, from two perspectives, the external stakeholders and the company itself. Uh, the new regulation will require to assess that relevance considering the impact that sustainability factors have on the corporate performance and its strategy and vice versa also the impact that the business activities have on people and environment what this means um, this means that uh, the new regulation requires to move from what is relevant to why 
it is relevant. And in this way, the company can have the opportunity to prepare a more focused report, avoiding a flat disclosure. Um, defining why an aspect uh, is relevant uh, means to identify and assess the related risk and opportunities, of course, considering uh, with the challenge to estimate not only the impact on the business, uh, so the inside effect as explained by Franco, but also the external effect. And it is uh, an important challenge because uh, um, to reply to that needs, uh, it is fundamental to ask the support and the involvement of the risk manager in the in this process. Um, the adoption of the risk management methodology usually already consolidated within our organization is the key to approaching the right way at, at these new requirements in my in my opinion. Mm. In that context, the latest and maybe the first challenge is to establish a cross-function collaboration over the entire process with a lot of functions. In my experience, of course, I had a double cap. So I am I am risk managers, but I am also sustainability director. So oh, the involvement as a risk manager is, is a easy. Uh, and uh, I took this opportunity to rethink the um, non-financial reporting process by applying a risk-based approach. Um, following, of course, the instruction of the Italian and European regulation, I started to identify and assess the main ESG-related risks and then, and then link to them the ESG aspect that must be subject to the materiality assessment. Uh, so the materiality evaluation done internally take into account uh, the company perspective um, and uh, is aligned to the ESG assessment, the risk assessment performed, and of course it is reflected in our materiality metrics. Starting from that approach to comply with the double materiality, we should extend uh, probably the risk assessment process to the effect uh, on people to the external effect on people and the environment. And uh, the problem is uh, uh, that we will need to understand how to calculate and estimate this kind of impacts. Uh, it is a big challenge. Um, anyway, I think that uh, we are following uh, the, the, the right uh, the right direction. So uh, I think, uh, again, let me repeat that uh, this uh, a new concept of double materiality, of course, for uh, us as a risk manager is a, a very good opportunity, a great opportunity. And uh, I hope that our colleagues that uh, are responsible of the non-financial reporting uh, will open their process asking by asking the involvement of uh, uh, risk managers uh, within, uh, within this process. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, for bringing you know this business perspective into um, into the discussion. And we clearly see that you know this new law will bring a lot of changes for companies who will have to report in far greater details and maybe differently all the ESG related matters. Um, so yeah, what you mentioned, they will need time for sure to adapt and and probably support as well to 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 make sure that they approach a new requirement in in the right way. Um, I will now open the floor to, to, to question. We will have a few minutes uh, for the Q&A. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are any questions coming in. Yes, we have a question for you, Valentina. Um, what do you recommend that risk manager who are not involved um, or who are not, as you are sustainability director, should do to be more involved in the topic? My suggestion is, of course, uh, to uh, start uh, from the introduction, the integration of the sustainability risk assessment in your risk, uh, traditional risk management process. So we had the occasion with Ferma to, to talk about uh, this topic many times. We had also in the past a webinar on that. So I think that uh, if we start uh, to 
identify, if, if we start to understand what are the sustainability risks for a comp for our company, we can start to make aware our management, our colleagues, our organization on the relevance of these kind of topics. And this could be the first starting point, the first step to approach also to the um, requirement of uh, a disclosure of this kind of information, starting from the analysis and the evaluation done from a risk perspective. Thank you, Valentina. There is a question also for you, Jean-Christophe, about, you know, we, we've been speaking about the CSRD, but also you mentioned that there was this new CSDD, so it's a corporate sustainability due diligence. What's basically the difference between the two? Um, so it, it's first it's dealt with by different services at the Commission. One, well, I mean, the main difference is that the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative is about behavior, while the CSRD is about reporting. So this is the the, the, the main element of difference, and um, and then the, the there will be due diligence reporting obligations within the standards, but that's again about the reporting element. So there is a link between the, the two initiatives, but they still have different scope for those objectives. Yeah, very clear. So there will be the two coming at the same time, complementing each other, basically. Uh, I have also a question for you, uh, Franco. Uh, basically, you mentioned that it's going beyond, you know, um, uh, compliance. It's about a transformation. So you, would you see the CSRD more as a revolution rather than an evolution? I think that mm, we are assisting, I mean, my, my personal view, my thinking is that it's a revolution in terms of economic uh, landscape and framework. Mm, I think that we, we are now trying to to figure out uh, a new way to approach business. We, we are not in considering that, for example, uh, we need to define a new concept uh, of products, of raw materials, uh, supply chain. So this is a revolution. CSRD, in terms of economic, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big revolution. I think it's uh, in terms of uh, new revolution for the new millennium of a new era is the best challenge that we will have for the next years uh, not only coming from climate change but for I'll give you an example coming from biodiversity and biodiversity is not the same of climate change it's quite different it's a big uh, challenge in terms for example of social consideration com coming from all we are happening now in terms of conflict, and we are, and we are, for example, for new uh, way to approach uh, business uh, coming from COVID uh, situation, so on. So, uh, from my point of view, CSRD, it's, it's it's a way to try to monitor and report what is happening in our in our what's happening in our corporation for 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 the actual data and for the future. But uh, I think that. Uh, we, the new entrepreneurship, uh, are uh, aware that it's an, a new, it's a new deal, it's a new way to approach business. I think that we need to understand in the right way, in the right time, and I think that the, the direction is the right direction. We need to understand the the right approach in terms of supporting the new hero of the economy, and she said they could be. I mean, and, and other pieces of the, the main building block in terms of assisting all, all, all the information and all the data, especially for the market participants. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I have a, a last question because I see that, you know, uh, the time is running. Uh, I think for both Jean-Christophe and, and, and Franco, um, it's regarding the, the assurance, you know, uh, for assurance of the report, what sustainability factors should be considered? Jan Christophe, do you want to? Uh, okay. 
uh, when we talk about the uh, sustainability information from my personal view uh, and I repeat personal view we need to understand what we are uh, on the mainstream and we are on the same level and same relevance of financial information okay this is the, the starting point otherwise we are not able to understand the, the importance and the uh, the journey on this on this on this topic so uh, when we consider the financial statement we have a full audit activities in terms of uh, uh, reliability of data accuracy and uh, let me say responsibility coming from this data in terms of board of directors uh, in terms of uh, all these stakeholders that are working on financial statement for the future uh, when we are uh, sustainability information inside the management report and the management report is a part of our report and <laughs> the direction is clear we need to work in order to have the same level of accuracy and assurance that we have for financial we need to define a roadmap in order to have the same uh, accuracy and the same assurance of sustainability information i think that we have no a chance in terms of different approach from my point of view we need to understand that for the future when we will have uh, in the next years information coming from sustainability we are the same relevance of revenues impairment uh, cash flow and so i think that we need to understand this uh, this approach so thank you very much um to all of our speakers. Uh, this webinar has come to its end a little bit later, um, but I hope you found you know, the presentation insightful, informative. This is the, the first webinar we are organizing on this topic, but definitely there will be other webinar on this topic. You will receive the replay of the webcast within the next 24 hours. Before closing, I'd like to share with you two pieces of information. So we are currently surveying the risk managers in Europe about the evolution of their role and responsibilities in the pandemic. So if you have not taken the time yet to uh, do the survey, please do it. You can find the link on this slide, but also on the FERMA website. And also we have just launched a registration to the FERMA forum, which will happen in Copenhagen this year in October. So I hope to see many of you in Copenhagen in October. Thank you very much. See you all at the next edition. Goodbye.